Our scripture reading this evening is found in two places, and indeed the text is found in both places, as we will compare an Old Testament passage with a new. The first reading is in Amos, Amos chapter 9. Amos is a book addressed to the ten tribes of Israel who had apostatized and continued to apostatize and the most dreadful judgments perhaps found in all the Bible are found in the book of Amos and chapter 9 is no exception to that. So this is a word to the apostatizing ten tribes who had forsaken God. Amos 9, I saw the Lord standing upon the altar, and he said, Smite the lintel of the door, that the posts may shake, and cut them in the head, all of them, and I will slay the last of them with the sword. He that fleeth of them shall not flee away, and he that escapeth of them shall not be delivered. Though they dig into hell, thence shall mine hand take them. Though they climb up to heaven, thence will I bring them down. And though they hide themselves in the top of Carmel, I will search and take them out thence. And though they be hid from my sight, In the bottom of the sea, thence will I command the serpent, and he shall bite them. Though they go into the captivity before their enemies, thence will I command the sword, and it shall slay them. And I will set mine eyes upon them for evil and not for good. And the Lord God of hosts is he that toucheth the land, and it shall melt. And all that dwell therein shall mourn, and it shall rise up holy like a flood, and shall be drowned as by the flood of Egypt. It is he that buildeth his stories in the heaven, and hath founded his troop in the earth, he that calleth for the waters of the sea, and poureth them out upon the face of the earth. The Lord is his name. Are ye not... As children of the Ethiopians unto me, O children of Israel, saith the Lord. Have I not brought up Israel out of the land of Egypt, and the Philistines from Kaphtor, and the Syrians from Kerr? Behold, the eyes of the Lord God are upon the sinful kingdom, and I will destroy it from off the face of the earth, saving that I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob, saith the Lord. For lo, I will command, and I will sift the house of Israel among all nations, like as corn is sifted in a sieve, yet shall not the last grain fall upon the earth. All the sinners of my people shall die by the sword, which say, The evil shall not overtake, nor prevent us. In that day will I raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen and close up the breaches thereof. And I will raise up his ruins and I will build it as in the days of old that they may possess the remnant of Edom and of all the heathen which are called by my name, saith the Lord, that doeth this. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper, and the treader of grapes him that soweth seed, and the mountain shall drop sweet wine, and all the hills shall melt. And I will bring again the captivity of my people of Israel, and they shall build the waste cities and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and drink the wine thereof. They shall also make gardens and eat the fruit of them. And I will plant them upon their land, and they shall no more be pulled up out of their land, which a sermon is verses 11 and 12. After all that judgment, 
is pronounced. Then we have this. In that day will I raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen and close up the breaches thereof. I will raise up his ruins and I will build it as in the days of old that they may possess the remnant of Edom and of all the heathen which are called by my name, saith the Lord that doeth this. Now we turn to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 15. The context here is Paul's missionary journeys and a discussion over whether the Gentiles had to be circumcised to be a part of the church in the New Testament. Acts 15, and certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dis disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. And being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy unto all the brethren. When they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God hath done with them. But there arose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed, saying, that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. And the apostles and elders came together for to consider of this matter. When there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, ye know how that a good while ago God made, a, made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe, and God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. Then all the multitude kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. And after they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets as it is written. And now verses 16 and 17 are a quotation of the verses that are the text in Amos. So these words now will help us interpret Amos. And the translation is good. But you will notice that the words are somewhat different from the text in Amos. He quotes the prophet in verse 16, After this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which is fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up, that the residue of men may seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. There we end the reading in the book of Acts. <clears throat> Beloved in the Lord Jesus Christ, consider a few questions having to do with the end of of the world. Do you believe that Jesus could come back at any moment and lift his people off from this earth? 
Do you believe that God's first intent and his ultimate purpose is with the kingdom of Israel? Not with the church as we know it today, but with Israel as a nation. That God sent Jesus to be their king, and when the Jews rejected Jesus as their king and put him to death, that God then determined to put aside the nation of Israel for a while and to gather to himself a church that would be separated, totally distinct from Israel. That he would gather his church for a while and then take them to heaven and then turn back to Israel and establish Israel as a kingdom, as a nation. That when Jesus comes this time, they will take him as their king, and they will rule the world. Do you believe that when Jesus comes, you or others might be left behind? That many of God's people will be taken to heaven, the true believers, but many will be left behind to face the wrath of the Antichrist. And finally, do you believe the kingdom of Jesus Christ will be an earthly kingdom of 1,000 years? The questions that I have asked, perhaps you recognize, are questions that exactly divide, separate us in the Reformed faith from those that are dispensational, premillennialists. They would answer yes to all those questions that I just asked. Dispensational premillennialists are usually found among those that are Baptist and those that are Pentecostal. They separate the Bible into dispensations. And in particular, what is the radical difference which starts out and then mag magnifies itself in many ways, is that they make an, a huge separation between the Old and New Testament, and between Israel as the kingdom people, and the church of the New Testament age. They are two entirely different bodies of people that are unrelated to each other at all. This is the teaching of a series of books about 10 years ago or so, the Left Behind series that I understand was then made, at least some of them, into movies as well, and which took much of the church world by storm as people wondered about the things that were written there and wondered if some of these things could be true. It's in that connection that we consider the prophecy of Amos, which is used by these dispensational premillennialists to prove that what will happen after the church is raptured to heaven is that God will turn to Israel and will establish the throne of David again in Jerusalem. And Jesus will rule from Jerusalem over an earthly kingdom that encompasses the world for 1,000 years and then give the kingdom up to his father. Amos 9 is used to support that idea, because there we read, In that day will I raise up the tabernacle of David which has fallen down. Close up the breaches thereof, raise up the ruins, and that they, Israel then, they say, may possess the remnant of Edom. They will possess Edom and all the heathen. They will rule the world, says the Lord. Well, Amos, as I noted earlier, was a prophet sent by God to pronounce judgments upon the ten tribes. He was a sheep herder from Tekoa, a small city about five miles from Bethlehem prophesied during the reign of Uzziah in, Jerusalem, in Judah and Jeroboam the second, the second Jeroboam, who was king over the ten tribes. And he came 
to Israel in their tremendous wickedness. The ten ten tribes had forsaken the house of David. They had forsaken the worship of God at the temple. They had forsaken Jehovah God himself and worshipped the golden calf. But they pretended that they were worshipping God and that everything was fine. In fact, of course, they were prosperous. The ten tribes had never had it so good. They were powerful, they were strong, they were rich. Now here comes this word from God through Amos. A word of fierce rebuke and a word of horrible judgment, destruction from God. It is nine chapters of judgment. We read part of it. The first half of chapter 9 has judgment in it. Isaiah, or rather Amos, sees a vision. The Lord standing upon the altar saying, Put them all to death. I will kill them all. None of them will escape. He's talking about the ten tribes. None of them shall escape. But then, totally unexpected, after eight and a half chapters of judgment, comes the words of the text. In that day, I will raise up the tabernacle of David. Now a promise of salvation comes to them. It does seem almost on the face of it, as if God is saying, Israel, as a nation, will be restored again. They will rule the nations, the Edomites and all the heathen. They will rule them all. But then you turn to Acts 15, which is a commentary on this. The verse is quoted by James in a very different context. And it makes it clear that the premillennialist idea that there is an earthly kingdom of Israel coming is completely wrong. And that if that's correct, that is not an earthly kingdom of Israel that's being referred to in Amos chapter 9, then all of their prophecies, wherever they latch on to the kingdom of Israel shall be restored, they're all wrong in their interpretation of those verses. Let's examine Amos chapter 9 verses 11 and 12 in the light of Acts 15 under the theme, God's promise to rebuild The tabernacle of David. God's promise to rebuild the tabernacle of David. Notice in the first place the astounding promise. Secondly, the glorious purpose. And finally, the certain realization. The astounding promise concerns the resurrection, the rebuilding of what's called the tabernacle of David. And I'm going to maintain that That is figurative language. When God speaks of a tabernacle of David, He's using a figure of speech. Now you children know what a figure of speech is. But maybe you don't think about it. In school, the teachers talk about this when you get up to fourth grade or so. Here's a figure of speech. If you would say about someone, he is running like a deer. You don't mean that literally. You mean he's running smoothly, he's quick, but he doesn't really run like a deer. That's not literally true. It's a figure of speech. If someone would say, I am so hungry, I could eat a horse. That's not literally true. It's a figure of speech. The Bible has figures of speech too. When Jesus said, I am the door, he did not mean he's literally a door. When he said, I am the vine, he is not literally a vine. It's a figure of of speech. The Bible has figures of speech. Here also it's evident that God is using a figure of speech when he talks about the tabernacle of David. Let's see that that's the case. First of all, the tabernacle is simply a tent, a shelter. What would be the tabernacle of David? If you read through all the historical accounts, there is never something in David's life for Samuel or in the kings. That's not found there. It's not to be taken literally. And the rest of the verse 
confirms it. Because God goes on to say, I will restore the, I will close up the breaches. Those are gaps in a wall. But a tabernacle, a tent, does not have gaps in it the way a wall does. And that God says, I will raise up the ruins of it. Again, you cannot raise up or build ruins of a tabernacle. Clearly, it doesn't make sense to speak of this as a literal tent. So what is the tabernacle of David? Well, first of all, a tabernacle is a temporary dwelling place. It's not the ordinary word for tabernacle in the New Testament where the ark was or the altar was. It's not that word. It's a different word that was used by God when He declared to the people, every year you must keep the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Tabernacles, God commanded Israel to keep once a year when they would go out of their houses, build themselves a little shelter out of branches, and go and live inside that temporary dwelling place for one week. The purpose of it being to point back to Israel that there was a time when they had all lived in tents in the, in the wilderness. It was to remind them of their humble beginnings. God had taken them out of Egypt, a nation of slaves. And then God had preserved them through the 40 years of wandering. The Feast of Tabernacles, which they were to hold every single year, would remind them of those two things. Their insignificant beginnings and God's preserving of them through the 40 years. Both of those ideas apply here when you are talking about the tabernacle of David. David had very lowly beginnings. God selected the youngest son of a sheep herder and made him to be the king in Israel. He did not come from royalty. He came from an insignificant family in an insignificant place called Bethlehem. And then God preserved David and exalted him and gave him such astounding promises that from you, God said to David, the Messiah will come. The promised Messiah will come from your line. This expression, the tabernacle of David, is found in one other place. It's in the book of Isaiah. And the book of Isaiah connects the tabernacle of David with a throne. Isaiah 16, verse 15, we read this. And in mercy shall the throne be established, and he shall sit upon it in truth in the tabernacle of David. In the tabernacle of David. Judging and seeking judgment and hasting righteousness. That's a passage about the Messiah. And it's pointing out that it is out of the loins of David that the Messiah would come. And he would sit upon the throne of David in the tabernacle of David. In the house of David, he would rule over Israel. Now God intentionally calls attention to David's rule. Because everyone knows, all our children know, the kingdom of David was an amazing thing. David had power. His enemies could not stand in front of him. The nation was at peace. The nation, after they, they could destroy their enemies, and they were wealthy, and they were dominant, and no one could stand in front of them. That's a kingdom of David. God intentionally draws attention to that. The tabernacle of David. The glorious kingdom of David. And yet, that God refers to it as a tabernacle does point yet to the fact that, relatively speaking, the kingdom of David was still quite insignificant compared to something else that is coming. The kingdom of David was quite insignificant. This verse is, if, if the phrase tabernacle of David is figurative, and it is, then the whole verse must be understood that way. We must understand then that the tabernacle of David and its throne implied is referring not to David ultimately, but it's to Jesus Christ. 
Because David is a picture of Jesus Christ. Isaiah chapter 11 verse 1 says that there shall come a rod out of the stump of Jesse and a branch out of his roots. And that branch is the Messiah. God promised to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7 that he would establish David's house and his throne forever. There will be no end to the rule. And God said amazingly about this king that would sit upon the throne. God said, I will be his father and he shall be my son. That's what God said about the one who was coming from David. And that clearly is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. As the angel said to Mary, these words, The Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, the throne of David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. So the one that was born of Mary is the promised Messiah out of the line of David. And he's the one that is pointed to in Amos. Not to David, but to the one who is coming to the Messiah, whose kingdom would be much, much greater than that of David. That is the point. The prophecy points to Christ. It's the tabernacle of Christ that God would set up. The kingdom would be Christ's kingdom. God prophesies. For we know that Jesus Christ is king. Already in Isaiah chapter 9, that well-known verse that a son is given to us and he is the prince of peace and the government shall be laid upon his shoulders. He is a ruler. Jesus Christ has a kingdom. He has a kingdom. When John the Baptist came into the world, he came as the forerunner of the king. And what did he say to the people? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The king is coming. He was the forerunner. And when Jesus came, what did he preach? The gospel of the kingdom is what he brought to the people. The Sermon on the Mount is an entire sermon on the kingdom. He describes the citizens of the kingdom. He tells them the laws of the kingdom. He shows them the blessedness of the kingdom. But that kingdom of Jesus Christ is a spiritual kingdom. A spiritual kingdom. It's not an earthly kingdom. And this is where so many go astray today. The premillennial dispensationalists look for a thousand year kingdom on the earth where Jesus Christ rules the world. And on the other hand, the post-millennialists are looking for things to get better and better and better until finally the whole world is Christianized. And we have a glorious kingdom of Christianity on the earth. And then Christ comes at the end of that. Both are wrong. The kingdom of Jesus Christ is not an earthly kingdom. It is, emphatically, a spiritual kingdom. You remember what it... The exchange that Christ had with Pontius Pilate, with with Pilate, when Pilate asked him, "Art thou the King of the Jews? Are you the King of the Jews?" and Jesus' answer was, "Yes, but my kingdom is not of this world. If it were of this world, then would my servants fight for me? My kingdom is not of hence." Even clearer than that, when the Pharisees in Luke chapter 17, verse 20, when the Pharisees asked, demanded, we read, demanded of him when the kingdom of God should come, because he had been talking about the kingdom so much. Well, when will this kingdom come? They demanded of him. He answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation." You do not expect the kingdom of God to come in some way that you can visibly see that kingdom coming. Not with observation. Neither shall they say, lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. And that word within you is the kind of word you would say to your children, do not go outside of the house, stay inside. The kingdom of God is inside of you. 
It's in your heart. It's not something you can see coming with observation. The kingdom is spiritual. That's why all of his parables start out the way they do. The kingdom of heaven is like this or that. And as to his return and his kingdom, Matthew 24, Jesus made it abundantly plain, the world will grow in wickedness. And the Antichrist will set up a kingdom of man. And there will be a worldwide persecution such as the church has never experienced because it will be worldwide, no place to run and hide. Then Christ will come. Not in a secret rapture that will draw His people off the earth suddenly and unexpectedly and then no one knows what's going on. The Bible has nothing to say about that. Rather, He will come physically. He will come on the clouds. He will come with great glory. He will come with the sound of a trumpet. You will know when Jesus comes. He will make it His public glorious entrance. And that is the end of the world. When He comes, He will gather before Him all the peoples of the world who have ever lived. He will divide His people, the sheep and the goats. And He will... Condemned to eternal destruction. Satan and his host, all the ungodly. And he will gather his own people unto himself into eternal life and bliss. And 2 Peter 3 says that all this world will be burned up. Everything will melt. And out of the ashes and the molten remains he will recreate a new heavens and a new earth, in which dwelleth only righteousness. Remember that. Only righteousness in that kingdom of Jesus Christ. But you say, does not Jesus Christ rule now? Heidelberg Catechism says He is our eternal King. He is our King now. And He is. But His kingdom is spiritual. His kingdom is within. The citizens of the kingdom are translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear Son. By the act of regeneration, the Spirit translates us from one kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And He sets up within the thrones, of, within the hearts of His people, the throne of Jesus Christ. Christ rules in your heart. You are part of the kingdom. He rules. That means we're no longer fit for this world. We're pilgrims and strangers in this world. And the citizens of that kingdom are not looking for an earthly kingdom. They're not laboring for an earthly kingdom. They know that that will never happen. Because Jesus says, you are but a little flock. That's all you are. You'll you'll never be. A mighty power in the world. This is what you must expect. They have hated me. They will hate you also. This is what you must expect. This is not pessimistic view of the future. This is simply taking what Jesus said and believing it. This is what God promises in Amos chapter 9. Something astounding. In light of the circumstances where God had said, I will scatter Israel. My chosen people have become to me like Ethiopia. I do not know them. They are not my people. And He would scatter Israel among the Assyrians so that they would never come back again as a nation. And Judah would follow in the same sins of the ten tribes and be taken into captivity and only a remnant of them would return to Jerusalem. The throne of David would be smashed. The kingdom of Israel would never rise again. And it would be down to what appeared to be a dead stump. The stump of Jesse. Where the only one left in the royal line of David was a woman, a virgin. 
No male members to sit on the throne. No male members to carry on the line of David. Just a virgin. It seems as though the line of David is finished. But now God's word is, it's not finished. I will raise it up. I will close the breaches on that kingdom. I will raise it up from the ruins. It will be as in the days of old, a glorious kingdom. In the light of the kingdom that God has in mind, the glory of the kingdom of Jesus Christ will be far greater than that of David's. Far greater. The way that God would accomplish this is also astonishing. In the way of humiliation, Jesus came into His kingdom. And we all know the story of Jesus riding down into the streets of Jerusalem on the colt of a donkey. Symbolizing the way into His kingdom is the way of lowliness, the way of humiliation. He would take upon Himself the form of a servant. He would come under the law. He would become guilty with the guilt of His people and He would therefore bear the wrath of God. He would give Himself to the cross. He would give Himself to the infinite wrath of God. He would give Himself to hell and to the grave. Utter humiliation. He would lower Himself to that. But by this means, He would effectively destroy His enemies. He would effectively save His people out of all the nations and establish His kingdom, a kingdom built upon His righteousness and His alone. God raised Him up. God set Him at His own right hand. Before He ascended into heaven even, Jesus said to His disciples, All power is given unto Me in heaven and in earth. And notice that James quotes Amos as a text that is being fulfilled in His day. Not off in some far distant glorious 1,000 year kingdom, but in His day, God is raising up the tabernacle of David. Jesus Christ sits upon the throne. He's ruling as king. This is the amazing promise of God. Out of the ruins of the destruction of the Old Testament, God will raise up the tabernacle of David into a kingdom far more glorious in Jesus Christ. But Acts 15 shows us also the purpose of God. That's the second thing we notice tonight. The glorious purpose. Because we read that, that, that is to say, in order that the residue of men might seek after the Lord. Now there is here a tremendous difference in the wording of Amos and the wording of Acts. Maybe you'll have one of them open and you can compare the two. I'll read the two versions. Amos says that they may possess the remnant of Edom and of all the heathen. Acts says that the residue, different word from they, that the residue of men, doesn't say anything about Edom, That the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles. Now as we try to compare the two, first of all, that he speaks of heathen and Gentiles, that's not a big problem. That's quite ordinarily done in the heathen in the Old Testament, Gentiles in the New. Generally they are those outside the covenant, those who are unbelievers. But the other is much more difficult. That they may possess the remnant of Edom is what, Mo, what Amos says. And that the residue of men might seek after the Lord is what the book of Acts says. Now, to understand this, first of all, who is Edom? Edom represents the heathen who are very definitely outside the covenant. Edom is from Esau. 
Esau was excluded by God from the covenant. There was no place for him in the covenant. And so his entire descendant, his entire nation is outside the covenant. They are enemies of Israel, dreadful enemies. Children, remember when Israel came up to the land of Canaan, the Edomites would not even allow the Israelites to walk through their land. They had to go way around. And when the Babylonians came and destroyed the city of Jerusalem, then the Edomites were there cheering them on. Raise it down to the foundations. Amos seems to give support to the premillennial idea. They shall possess the Edomites and all the heathen. It sounds like Israel will finally come back. Will come back and rule over the Edomites and all the heathen nations. But the book of Acts gives a very different message. Now we will seek to reconcile the two, but understand that the Holy Spirit is the one author of Amos and of the book of Acts, and that the, book, that the Spirit, therefore, is the one who interprets Himself. In the book of Acts, He is interpreting what we read in Amos by putting it in different words. And he makes it plain in Acts 15 when he says that the residue of men might seek the Lord. That you must not draw from Amos that Israel will conquer them. That Israel will rule over them physically. But that there will be a tremendous change as far as Edom is concerned. They were the outcast. They were separated from Israel. They were outside of the covenant. And now they will seek the Lord. Possession here does not mean ownership and rule, but it means unity. Israel and the Gentiles will be brought together into one glorious church, the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Because remember the context here in Roma in Acts chapter 15. In Acts chapter 15, they are coming together to discuss the question, must Gentiles be circumcised and keep the law of Moses? If they are to be a part of the church, that's their great difficulty. And there were those insisting that they had to, and Paul and Barnabas were saying, that's in no way what God requires of Gentiles. And the Jerusalem conference determined that that was not necessary. And it was not necessary exactly because the Gentiles and the Jews would be brought together into one, into the church. That's what Jesus said would happen. You remember how He said, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto Me. And He wasn't saying, I will save every individual. What He was saying is, the church will not merely be Jews any longer. I will draw all men, all kinds of men, all nations unto Me. And Pentecost said that. The Holy Spirit giving the apostles the ability to speak in many languages so that it announced the Catholicity of the church. No longer merely Israel. Romans 11 says this is what happened. Israel is an olive tree. But God broke off some of the natural branches of that olive tree and grafted into that tree Gentiles. The natural branches had to be broken off because of unbelief. The Gentiles are grafted into the same tree. It's one tree. Israel in the Old Testament now carried on into the church out of all the nations, including the Jews, but now out of all the nations. We can go back farther than that. Because Noah said, Japheth, will inhabit the tents of Shem. Japheth, from whom would come the Gentile nations, will come and inhabit the tents of Shem, represented by Abraham and Israel. 
This must be the explanation. For James says in verse 14, Simon Simeon hath first declared how God did at the first visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And what is that a reference to? Peter going to Cornelius after that great vision of the unclean animals. And they're in the home of Cornelius preaching the gospel. And all these Gentiles start speaking in tongues. He's utterly amazed. God is clearly gathering His church from the Gentiles. And Peter is relating that. That when he preached to the Gentiles, God clearly gathered them into the existing church. And now, he says, now, of course, Paul and Barnabas are testifying to the same thing. And then he says, to this, verse 15, to this agree the words of the prophets as it is written. Now, there's many prophets who prophesied of how the Gentiles would come into the Israelite nation and make a, a church, but he quotes one of them. He quotes Amos 9 as one example of how the prophets foretold this. I will raise up the tabernacle of David, and the residue of men will seek unto the Lord. This is God's word in Amos. If James did not mean that, then his comments are totally irrelevant. This is what he intended to convey. God said, I will return. God would return to Israel after thrusting them away for a time into captivity. He would return and bring them back in mercy to Jerusalem. And for a little while there, the glimmerings of the old Israel, just glimmerings, during Ezra and Nehemiah's time, and then there would be no Israel, no nation that could survive on its own. But God would return and incorporate Israel and all the Gentiles into one glorious kingdom. The tabernacle of David will be raised up. God promised it. God had a purpose. To gather a church of so many members that you cannot count them. So many members. Out of all the nations, not merely Jews any longer, not merely Jews, they and so many other nations of the world. Built into one church. You can read Ephesians 2, 11 to the end of the chapter, and where it talks about the fact that there were Gentiles who were strangers to the covenant, but now they are brought together. Jews and Gentiles built into one dwelling place of God, one tabernacle, well, God will dwell forever and ever. That's the promise that God intended to fulfill. His church. Necessary that that church reflect the glory of God by a diversity. A church of so many members, not only that you cannot count, but everyone different. And then from different races and different cultures and different Nations, high and low, men and women, gathered into this one glorious church that would be part of the kingdom of Jesus Christ, the tabernacle of David. That's the glorious fulfillment of Amos chapter 9. This glorious church, this kingdom of Jesus Christ. Now I'm going to ask you a bit of an odd question, maybe. But does that disappoint you? That that's the glory of Christ's kingdom? That spiritual kingdom? That church that He has gathered? And the kings come and bow the knee before Jesus and they bring their gifts. And the whole wide world is forced to confess that Jesus is King. There's something about that that appeals to us, isn't there? That... That all the wicked who are now so opposing Him that will blaspheme Him and that all the rulers of the whole wide world will come and bow before Jesus in Jerusalem and He will rule over them with a rod of iron. 
There's something about that that's very appealing. Maybe we even think that gives Christ more glory, doesn't it? But look again at that kingdom for a moment. It's all earthly. Look on the motorcade that brings the rulers into Jerusalem to up driving up to the palace of Jesus and notice the rust on the cars. And notice how some of their clothes are a little frayed at the edges. And notice even the clothes of Jesus can get dirty and stained in this kingdom if he would have such a kingdom. But worst of all, in that kingdom of the premillennialists, sin remains. Thieves will still break through and steal in his kingdom. And those kings that come on bended knee will be coveting the glory and power of Jesus Christ. And some of them would have hatred in their heart and are plotting behind his back to overthrow him. And according to the premillennialists, that's what will happen. Sin would still be in that kingdom. Is that the glorious kingdom that Jesus Christ deserves? Just a 1,000 year kingdom where he rules over an earthly kingdom and then he loses the kingdom as he gives everything to his Father? Is that what he deserves for bearing the infinite and eternal wrath of God against our sins and purchasing a people that God loved from eternity? Just a 1,000 year earthly kingdom? Absolutely not. What a disappointment for Jesus, if that's all He gets. What a disappointment for you and me when Jesus says to us, be sure your treasures are in heaven, not here on the earth. Or with Moses, who esteemed the reproach of, great, of, of Christ greater riches than the riches of Egypt. Because he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. A heavenly reward. An eternal reward. Beloved, behold the glory. And now you need faith to see it. But behold the glory of Jesus Christ. He is sitting at God's right hand right now. He is above all principalities and powers and every name that is named. And He will be there eternally. Eternally. All things are His kingdom in heaven and in earth. The day is coming when all things will be in perfect subjection. His enemies will be not merely bowing the knee. They will be cast out of the kingdom. There will be no place for them in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And His saints will who will all be sinless saints, will sing with the angels in glory. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and power and wisdom and might. And no one will doubt that He deserves it, because everyone in that kingdom will recognize, I do not deserve to be here. I'm here because I've been purchased by the blood of the King. And that we will all honor Him Perfectly. That's the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And no death. And no sin. No sin. Will that happen? Will that promise of God to raise up the tabernacle of David and to set Jesus upon a throne of Eternal glory, will that happen? It most certainly will. In the first place, it's certain because it's already accomplished in principle. On the cross, Jesus defeated all His enemies, every last one of them. God already lifted up His Son and exalted Him to His throne, sitting at His right hand. And all that awaits the final glorious kingdom is that every last one of those elect people have been born and gathered into the church. That must happen first. And then the cup of iniquity must be filled up so that Christ can come as a perfectly righteous judge 
to execute judgment upon the ungodly. And Jesus will take then what his Father promised him. That's all we know it's certain, first of all. It's already accomplished in principle. But secondly, the text in both places, Amos and Acts, makes a point of this. Seth the Lord, who doeth all these things. God does these things. Jehovah God, the unchangeable God, the God who cannot lie. He is faithful to His Word. He promised to raise up the tabernacle of David. He promised His Son an eternal kingdom founded upon the righteousness of His own Son. He will surely do what He said. And He's sovereign. No one can resist Him. No one can change His plans. He is absolutely sovereign. He will accomplish it. What a tremendous comfort to us today. Because the days of Amos in many ways are what we're living in. The church has apostatized and continues to apostatize and says, we are good. Everything is well with us. And God's judgment will come on that church and we will bear some of the dreadful consequences. We will be in persecution. But we have this blessed comfort, which is not pessimistic confidence in Jesus Christ. He has the victory. He will bring history to a close. He will accomplish everything that the prophets foretold. A glorious kingdom. Is that your hope? Then your hope is sure. Amen. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank Thee for Thy Son. We thank Thee for the Word, the promises, and for the reality that is already in and through the cross of Christ and that glorious prophecy that will be fulfilled completely. Lord, strengthen our faith and our hope in the coming of the King. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.